We're going to go into like a mini sermon before the regular sermon. Y'all okay with that mini sermon before the regular sermon? This is for everybody that's participating in the fast. Matthew 6, 17 says, but when you fast, comb your hair and wash your face. Ooh, I felt like a mom got a word for her teenage son today. Come on, went, just comb your hair and wash your face this morning. Anyone just receive that today? When you fast, comb your hair, wash your face. Then no one will notice that you are fasting except your father. This is Jesus talking, by the way, who knows what you do in private. And your father who sees everything will reward you. So here's what I want to say. Nobody needs to know that you're fasting over the next 19 days. Because it's not about that. If that's what you're all about, that's the only reward that you're going to get. You fast in the secret place. You pray in the secret place. And you watch what God does in your own heart. And so listen, I will allow you, just because I'm gracious, you can take one picture of your food over the 19 days and post it on social media, but just one, just one picture, that's all you're getting, and I'm just kidding. But it's important that it's, it's, it's not about bringing it on to yourself, it's about proximity to the Father during these next 19 days. Five truths about fasting. Truth number one, fasting is not a diet. This is the mini sermon. Fasting is not a diet. And here's how I'll say it. If you are fasting and not praying, you're actually not fasting, you're just dieting. And so uh, it's not about, it's you gotta pray whenever you fast, It's or else it's just a diet. Y'all with me during the 10 a.m. today? Okay. Um, also, point number two, careful not to spend more time thinking about what you can't do. Instead, focus on what you get to do. So your conversations shouldn't be about cupcakes and how much you miss them and coffee and how much your head hurts and all that stuff. It should be about what you believe God is going to do in your life. Point number three, the devil wants to discourage you if God doesn't move immediately. This is important for you to understand that if 12 hours into the fast, if God hasn't answered all of your prayers, that's okay. <laughs> We're not on our time, we're on his time in Jesus' name. And so, listen, it, God might answer all your prayers in, in 20 minutes, and that's amazing. Or it might kickstart what God wants to do in your life long term, and that's okay too. But number four, let us not fast for only current events, but rather let's also fast for his presence. Number five, fasting is not meant to be efficient, it's meant to be effective. It should be difficult. It should be hard. You should have those steak and little Debbie's cravings for the next few weeks. And those cravings should be a physical reminder for you to pray and seek the presence of the Lord. We read last night as a family along the din uh, on the dinner table, uh, we read Luke chapter four. Well, it was in the kid's Bible, but I knew where it was. It's in Luke chapter four. And we read that Jesus goes out into the desert. Y'all ever read this one before? To be tempted by the devil for 40 days. Jesus ate nothing for 40 days. And I imagine that was very, very difficult, but you're giving up something in the physical so that you can get closer to God in the spiritual. That's what a fast is all about. And um, I, I just encourage you also, if you have children, explain the fast to them. Use this as a moment to teach your children. And what my son and my daughter decided was they're gonna do no candy and no sweets. They said for three days. So all the Focus Kids teachers, you better be watching when you hand out those lollipops today. Like, no, your dad said you were fast. No, just let them decide. Let them decide. And we'll see what, we'll see what happens. Pray for my family during this time. There's some things that we're praying for as a family that we just need God to, to work out. And as I pray for you, I hope that you'll pray for me as well. Okay, we're going to recap Daniel chapter 1. Y'all with me today? Okay, recap Daniel chapter 1. Daniel, Daniel and his friends are taken from Israel, from Judah, into Babylon. Remember, Daniel doesn't take place in Judah. It takes place in Babylon. And they're under the rule of King Neb, short for Nebuchadnezzar. Look to your favorite neighbor and say, King Nebuchadnezzar. King Neb wants to indoctrinate Daniel and his friends in a pagan, sinful Babylonian culture, we learned last week. We learned that in a Babylonian culture, three things exist. They want to change your identity. Y'all remember that? They want to change your identity. 
They want to change what you consume. King Nebuchadnezzar wanted to exchange their food, and it's ultimately a test of your faith. And last week's sermon summed up was, you can remain steadfast to the Lord even in a sinful culture and world, and boy, do we live in the middle of Babylon right now. I think that this book of the Bible is so crucial that we study it right now, just in the midst of everything that's going on, how to remain steadfast to the Lord. Daniel chapter two. It's a long passage of scripture, but we're gonna tackle it together. Daniel chapter two, verse one. One night during the second year of his reign, King Neb had had such disturbing dreams that he could not sleep. He called his magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers and demanded that they tell him what he had dreamed. Listen to this. Not just the interpretation of the dream. He said, I need you to tell me what I dreamt. He said, I've had a dream that deeply troubles me and I must know what it means. We're going to skip down to verse 10. But three through nine, King Nebuchadnezzar, he goes to his wise men And he says, if you cannot recount the dream that I had and interpret it, then you're going to be, and this is the Bible that says, you're going to be torn limb from limb and your houses are going to be turned to rubble. That's a bad day at work, ladies and gentlemen. A very, very bad day. Your work environment does not seem so bad. Your boss is actually quite gracious compared to King Nebuchadnezzar, verse 10. The astrologers replied to the king, no one on earth can tell the king his dream. No king, however great or powerful, has even asked such a thing of any magician, enchanter, or astrologer. The king's demand, it's impossible. No one except the gods can tell you your dream, and they do not live here among people. The commentator David Guzik writes this. Despite all of their wisdom, real and imagined, these wise men had no answer for Nebuchadnezzar because only God can bring an answer to the king. Strauss writes this. He says, they were like some modern ministers of our own day who spend their time studying philosophy, psychiatry, psychology, social science, political science, and then continue under the pretense that God, that under the pretense of being God's messengers to men. Be careful that you don't get your theology from TikTok, ladies and gentlemen. Be careful that you don't get your theology and your biblical understanding from YouTube shorts. And let me impress something. Just because they have a doctor in front of their name does not mean that they're filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. You need to test everything. You need to test everything that's said from this pulpit. You need to test everything that you hear online. And if it doesn't align with the word of God, it doesn't belong in your home. You have to test the spirits. Test the wisdom. Just because they got more degrees than a thermometer does not mean that you need to listen to everything that they, that you, that they say. Say amen if you believe that today. Amen. Okay, where are we at? Verse 12. The king was furious when he heard this and he ordered that all the wise men in Babylon be executed. And because of the king's decree, men were sent to find and kill Daniel and his friends. When Ariach, the commander of the king's uh, Guard came to kill them. Daniel handled the situation with wisdom and discretion. Verse 15. He asked Ariach, why has the king issued such a harsh decree? So Ariach told him all that had happened. So the king is just burning with frustration. It's not only a layoff. He just wants to kill every single one of his wise men at this point. He's so frustrated. Verse 19. Y'all still good? You still, I know it's a long piece of scripture. Y'all still good? Okay. Touch your neighbor. Say, you still good, neighbor? You still with me? Verse 19. That night, the secret, come on, say secret, was revealed to Daniel in a vision. God wants to reveal secrets to you as you're, as you're listening to him. And then Daniel praised the God in heaven. He said, praise the name of the Lord forever and ever. 
for he has shown all wisdom and power. Listen to this. He controls the, the course of the world events. Come on, you don't need to worry. God controls the course of the world events. He removes kings. He sets up other kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the scholars. He reveals deep and mysterious things and knows what lies hidden in the darkness. Though he is surrounded by light, I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors, for you have given me wisdom and strength. You have told me what we asked, for, uh, asked of you and revealed to us what the king demanded. Okay, verse 24 through 45 is all about the king's dream. Verse 24 through 45, Daniel communicates the dream to King Nebuchadnezzar based on what the Lord has said and then also interprets the dream. We don't have time to go over everything. In a nutshell, the dream is the future of Babylon. Who's going to conquer Babylon and the next four kingdoms that are going to conquer Babylon? You can read about that this week in Daniel chapter 2. Nevertheless, Daniel interprets the dream and tells the king what the dream was and then here's what the king's response is. Then King Nebuchadnezzar threw himself down before Daniel and worshiped him. He commanded the people to offer sacrifices and burn sweet incense before him. Verse 47, the last verse we're gonna read. The king said to Daniel, truly your God is the greatest of all gods, the Lord over kings, a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this secret. Then at the very end of the chapter, King Nebuchadnezzar brings Daniel and appoints him over everything in the kingdom, over every wise man, over every council, over everything in Babylon. King Nebuchadnezzar raises Daniel up to the highest place of authority. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for Daniel chapter two. Help us to understand why you wrote it and what to be changed by through it. In Jesus' name, amen. I was with some of our interns on Tuesday and I was going over Daniel chapter two and I'm like, this is gonna be the most difficult chap chapter of scripture I've ever preached in my entire life. And, and um, I wanna approach the text through not a Western perspective, but I want to do my best to approach it from an Eastern perspective. Now, you and I are Westerners. If, if you're an American like me, you are a Western. Most of us are Westerners. I know I look Jewish. I am not Jewish. I'm just white. I'm just totally white. My mom is white. My dad is Caucasian. So there's a little bit of a diversity in there, but I, a little bit. But anyway. Some of you will get that joke just going home tonight. You're like, what, what did he mean? Why did they laugh? I don't get that. Are they, I don't know. And anyway, so I was in Israel one time. They were speaking to me in Hebrew. I had no idea. I mean, they had no, I had no idea. Maybe they thought that I was Jesus. I don't know. I had just no idea. A Western, a Western point of, of, of interpreting the scripture asks this question. When, when a Westerner would read the text, they would ask, how does this apply directly to me? It's a little bit selfish. It's a little bit me-centered. And uh, if you grew up studying the Bible like that, that's okay. If you've never had this explained, that's what this moment is for. We're not gonna approach the text through that question. We're not gonna approach the text through, God, what, what is this? Though the Bible was written for you, it wasn't written to you. Does that make sense? It was written for you, it wasn't written to you. We're going to approach the text through an Eastern perspective, and, and to best help you understand, it's more of, God, what's the original purpose for understanding and reading this passage of Scripture? What's your original intent when I'm supposed to read this text? And when we can best understand the original intent of the author, when we can best understand the original intent of the text itself, will have a greater impact on our personal lives. If you're with me, say yes. We're gonna do our best to interpret the scripture like that. I wanna give you one key truth and then we're gonna dive into three points. Write this down if you're taking notes. There are things that God wants to do in me and through me in Babylon. 
There are things that God wants to do in me and through me in Babylon. In fact, I'll say it like this, and I don't want to give away the whole sermon, but there are certain things that God could not do in Daniel in Judah. There are things that God could not test Daniel with in Judah. There are circumstances that he would have never been part of had he stayed in Israel. I believe that God had to bring Daniel to Judah to test him, to mature him and to ultimately save his friends and so much more. When we understand that, we can understand the next portion, which is if that's true for Daniel, that might also be true for Michael. That there are some things that God cannot do in Michael in Israel. There are some times where God has to take Michael, I'm Michael by the way, Michael from Israel to Babylon. We cannot neglect the Babylonian seasons of our life because sometimes the growth that needs to happen is not going to happen in Judah. The growth that needs to happen is in the pagan, sinful, diabolical culture of Babylon under an evil king. Are y'all with me today? In order for God to do and accomplish what he wanted to do in and through Daniel, he had to take Daniel out of comfortability. He had to take Daniel about a place that he was accustomed to, where he spoke the language, where he understood the culture, where he ate the food. He had to uproot, which was rooted, and bring into a place that he needed Daniel to be. Let's pray, because that was the whole sermon. Jesus, thank you so much. Just kidding. There's more. There's more today. Some of you are really happy about that. You're like, I'm going to grab a cookie and, and get out of here. No, I got lots more time. Just chill. (laughs) Point number one, in order to learn the Lord's heart, you must first learn his voice. In order to learn the Lord's heart, you must first learn his voice. Think about this for a moment. Daniel and his friends were about to be killed. They were in such danger. Daniel himself was about to be killed. If, If Daniel... If Daniel wasn't able to clearly hear the voice of the Lord, then the book of Daniel would have been a very short book. (laughs) If Daniel wasn't able to hear the voice of the Lord, hear the voice of the Spirit of God, then not only would he have died, his friends would have died as well, and he would have never been exalted to the highest place in Babylon. It's crucial that you learn what God's voice sounds like. Three amens on this. Let me try this side over here. Try the West Campus real quick. It's pivotal. It's crucial in your life that you hear and can differentiate the voice of the Lord in your own life and appropriately obey his leading. If you cannot, you'll never discover the heart of God for your life. In order to understand his heart, you have to tune into his voice. Husbands, there's never been a more important time for you to lead your family in the ways of the Lord. And you cannot do that unless you gain an understanding of what his voice sounds like. Being a husband is being a leader of the household, and it has less to do with an authoritarian, here's the direction that we're going, and if you don't like it, buckle up, buttercup, and it has more to do, exponentially more to do, with you communicating to your family, this is what I've heard the Lord speak to me, and this is the direction that my family is going to go. It's not up to you to lead your family, it's up to the Lord to lead your family through you. And if you're not allowing the, I'm preaching, if you're not allowing the Lord to lead your family through you, you're not biblically leading your family. I felt last week in that one. Last week was too mean. This week was supposed to be encouraging. Let me just, let me just talk to the wives. Let me just talk to the wives real quick. You have a responsibility in hearing the voice of the Lord as well. You have an accountability to that. You are responsible that so is your husband, but you're responsible for hearing the voice of the Lord for your children. 
And I'll say this, there have been many, many, many times where my wife, Pastor Micaela, she's heard the, the word of the Lord for not only our children, but our family as a whole. So let me just speak to the wives that, that you can hear the voice of the Lord for direction for your family as well. Sometimes the Lord will speak to you specifically. In fact, it was just last night. My wife and I, we're, we're in this weird season and we're just, we're trying to navigate some things and our family is growing and our kids are changing and we're getting older. I mean, all, the, all of these things are, and the church is in this, you know, we're in this churches and there's just so much going on. And there's some things that we're just praying and believing God for, but, but the, the future, it's like, we don't know what to do. You ever been there before? You're just like, I don't even know. I don't even know what, I don't even know which direction to go. So we've been just praying and asking the Lord just to, just to give us some wisdom, some knowledge. And last night we were talking and she said, um, she said, babe, well, she, she said, man of God, <laughs> she's, she's, she didn't say that. She said, <laughs> that was a joke. That was a joke. She didn't say that. So one day, no, I just, I just, she said, she said, babe, <laughs> she said, I felt, I felt like the Lord said this. I don't know, like, because sometimes you just don't know. Even as, even as one of your pastors, like, there have been very few times where I've been 100% sure that that's the Lord. Most of the time, it's by faith. And, mo and every single time, I have to filter it through what the Bible says. I'll teach you that in a moment. But my wife was saying, you know, I feel like this is the Lord, and, and maybe this is a thing that would use us to be helpful for us. And I just looked at her, and I said, okay, that aligns with Scripture. So, babe, we're going to take that as, as a word from the Lord for our family, and we're going to walk in that. You know, Ephesians chapter 5 says uh, there needs to be mutual submission between husband and wife. And yes, the man is the leader of the household, but, but here's how that looked last night. It looked like, you know what, the Lord has given you a word. We're going to walk in that word, believing by faith that it's from God, but we're also going to pray that if that's not the direction that the Lord would correct our course. Amen. Are you guys understanding this today? It's important that you know the Bible. I think knowing the Bible is actually most important when being able to recognize the voice of the Lord. Because there are three voices in everyone's mind. Maybe, maybe there's more for you. I think, I think I just thought of that. I'm like, I don't know. Um, I don't know. There's for sure three, okay? There's your voice, my, my voice. Sometimes that one is the loudest, by the way. Sometimes that's emotionally driven. Sometimes that's feeling driven. There's the voice of the Lord, and there's the enemy's voice. You as a believer, you, you have to be like Daniel and you have to gain an understanding of the difference of those three voices in your head. Yeah. That takes a lot of prayer. That takes a lot of obedience to the Lord. That takes a lot of knowing the Bible. Like you have to be a student of the Bible because here's why that's important. If on your drive home today, you hear the Lord, he's like, go to Taco Bell. You're like, no, that's probably, that's probably the enemy. Like, if you, I'm just kidding. if you hear the voice of the Lord, and if it doesn't line up with scripture, it's not the voice of the Lord. But you'll never be able to know that unless you know scripture. <laughs> I don't know if this is old school today, but if you hear the Lord say, get angry and not forgive someone, like, that's not what the Bible says. And so you can clearly understand that that's not a word from the Lord. That's either me or that's the enemy or it's, it's whatever. But if you hear the voice of the Lord say, go to this person or say this thing. Or, and you're like, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back and I'm going to try to study the word and see if that word aligns with the text you're more confident that that's a word from the Lord for your life. Is this making sense today? You have to hear the voice of the Lord. If Daniel didn't hear the voice of the Lord, if he didn't know what it sounded like, everyone would have been killed. Daniel chapter three would have never happened. You have to hear the voice of the Lord for your life. When Mickey, my wife and I, we were first getting to know each other, it's funny. I didn't, I didn't remember this in first service. We actually met at National Fine Arts Festival. Yeah, so we met at National Fine Arts Festival. Now, we were in our mid-20s, so students, 
take a freaking chill pill, okay? Uh, that's not where you're going there. We were in our mid-20s. We had, yeah, that's, but anyway, we met at National Fine Arts Festival. Sorry, that was mean. And we, uh, and so here's what happened. We like met, we were introduced to one another and we, we, we said hello and everything. And we didn't get numbers or anything. It was like kind of in passing. And then uh, she actually, a few months later, she actually liked one of my Facebook photos. So she, she totally made the first move and uh, <laughs> that's true. And, but I did the honorable thing. So I definitely messaged her after that. and was just like, I want your feedback on what that photo was like. And I felt like that was my due diligence to just make sure that, that I messaged her just for follow-up, all intents and purposes, just to be a gentleman. And, and so then she, and then we, and then, and then everything. And now we have three children. And so I don't know, I don't know like where, I don't know like how, but that's kind of where, where we've been. And the first few months of our dating relationship, we were, in, we were long distance. And so I was in Missouri, she was in Miami, Florida. And the only way for me and for her to understand each other's hearts was by understanding each other's voices. We spent hours and hours. Y'all remember Skype? Come on now. We were on Skype. And uh, text messages and phone calls. This is before I had a, a smartphone. This is, this is when I had the, the Motorola or whatever it was, the, the flip ski. And uh, we'd spend hours texting and talking. And I knew, I actually knew that I loved her before we went on our first date. Because... I knew her heart. Yeah. I knew her voice. It was through talking to her, it was through communicating that I actually had a better understanding of her heart. And it was, it was cool. I, I've never told anyone this before, but actually on our first date, we went to Cheesecake Factory because that's the greatest food in all the land, obviously. <laughs> and we went to Cheesecake Factory and then we walked on uh, Fort Lauderdale Beach that, that night. And uh, we sat down on the beach and I, I told her, I said, I love you. And then I said, and also, will you be my girlfriend? And so kind of like a reverse order there, but it, it worked out. It worked out for the best. It worked out for the best. Point number two, God wants us to know that he's in control no matter the circumstance. And I got to admit, I struggled with this point. I wrote this sermon on Tuesday and was praying about it. And then last night I was like, ah, oh, God, come on. Like, is that really? And because I, I, I struggle with that. I have sometimes a tough time dealing, like the letting go of control, the releasing of like, because, because have you ever felt like you're responsible for more than that which you have control over? <laughs> like there's more weight on your shoulders than you can squat. There's more on the bench than you can press. You have more plates in your hands than you have arms. There's more on your shoulders than you can possibly bear. And here's the truth of the text. It's found right in the middle of Daniel chapter 2. When you're sensitive to the Lord, when you learn to hear his voice, you can be confident. Come on, look to your favorite neighbor and say confident. You can be confident that even in a hopeless situation, we serve an impossible God. Even in an impossible situation, we serve a God who does the impossible. Maybe I'm just preaching to myself today, but I'm reminding myself today that even in the midst of situations that I'm like, I don't know the outcome, God will take care of it if I'm in alignment with his spirit. God will take care of it if I'm in alignment with his voice. He will take care of it. Think about this. Daniel and his friends, they're up against an impossible task. If the king, if King Neb, Nebi, if King Neb told them the dream and then just said, all you have to do is interpret it, they could have lied. <laughs> they could have made something up. They could have finagled their way to a good interpretation of the dream. And that's not, that's not what happened. King, king Nebuchadnezzar said, you not only have to interpret the dream, you have to tell me what the dream was. It's an impossible circumstance. It's an impossible situation. But because Daniel was in tune with the Lord, impossible does not mean impossible when you're with the Lord. I mean, it's so hard to interpret things. My wife is telling me things all the time. I don't know what they mean. The other day, we were at dinner. And I'm saying stuff. I don't know what I was saying. I'm saying some stuff. And she's hitting me under the table. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, 
why are you hitting me under the table? And it's like, oh, I found out that that's, that means be quiet. Like that actually means don't say what you're currently saying. I didn't know that. One time she was winking at me like, do you have something in your eye? Like woman, like open up your eye. Like what's, let me see what's going on in your eye. And she was saying, just be quiet as well. And I, I learned that later on. Um, <laughs> I'm just helping it. I'm just helping y'all out today. Okay, just, well, let me help out the wives. If, you, if your husband is anything like me, like we just, we need clarity. We just need a lot of clarity and the winks and the, we just, sometimes we just don't get those. 10 years married in December and I'm like, I'm just learning what that meant. Thank you so much for explaining that to me. If I have in trouble interpreting my wife who knows me better than anyone in the entire planet, how in the world am I supposed to interpret a dream that I've never heard before? But when you serve the God of the impossible, he makes room for the possible to happen in your life. Maybe this is just what you needed to hear. Maybe it's just encouragement today that God has it under control as long as you're in his control. Deuteronomy 31 says this, do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord will personally go, personally go ahead of you. He will be with you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. I want you, I want to pray for you. Lift up your hands at all of our locations. I pray in Jesus name that you would not be afraid or discouraged. I pray in Jesus' name that that the Lord would go before you, that if you're up against an impossible task, that God would give you peace that surpasses all understanding, that if your marriage is broken, may it be restored right now in Jesus' name, that if you feel like you are the mistakes of your past, may you be reminded that you are a new creation, that the old is gone, the new has come. I pray that the Lord would go before you and behind you and bless you and keep you in Jesus' name name. Give God some praise if you receive that today. John, you can come. Point number three, we're going to close with this. God wants us to embrace the seasons. Again, it's a, it's a, hard, it's a hard point to get, but God wants us to embrace the seasons. My, my dad, uh, he told me something that I'll never forget. And I've shared this once or twice over the years, but he said, in every season of life, God is intentionally trying to teach you something in every season of life. And sometimes God won't move you out of where you're currently at until you've learned what you needed to learn. So sometimes the Babylonian seasons, it's us keeping ourselves there because we're too stubborn and prideful to learn and receive what we need to learn and we need to receive. I've been through a season like that in my own life where I had to be rebuked. I had to be corrected by a mentor of mine. And he said, until you learn what's happening right now, God will never release you into your next phase. And I promise you, the moment that I learned, it was not more than two weeks that God released me to the next season of my life. Be careful that you don't keep yourself in Babylon for too long because you're too full of pride. Be careful that, you, that you're not so proud that you won't humble yourself and say, okay, God, I'm in the middle of this, but what are you trying to teach me? I think Daniel understood this. That's why in 21, verse 21, he says, he controls the world events. He removes kings and sets up other kings. He gives wisdom to the wise. He reveals deep secrets mysterious things. I thank you and praise you, Lord. He's saying like in every season, God is in control. He wants to teach you something. Many of you know our story. I won't go into the full depth of it, but I'll just share very lightly the last few years of the Whitlock's life. My name is Michael Whitlock. And I'll just share the last few weeks of the Whitlock's life. You know, in, in COVID, we were pretty much doing what everyone else was doing. We were trying to have, we were practicing to have babies. And so during that time, there wasn't just, there was just wasn't a lot to do. So we were just, that's, just, anyway, so we, we have two kids and um, COVID happened. And uh, we just felt like the Lord was like, you're going to have a third kid. And we just felt that. That was during 2020. A lot of you know this story, but I'm going to give you a different angle to it. And, you know, we had multiple miscarriages and miscarriage and miscarriage. And we just felt like we were in a Babylonian season. That's what we really felt like. We, we felt like that what we're in doesn't align. It doesn't align up with what we read in the Bible. <laughs> you ever felt like that before? That you're like, what I'm going through, I don't feel like 
I don't feel like I read about that in the scripture. You probably need to read Lamentations, but uh, it's a different, different time. And we were talking to some friends of ours last Friday. They came over our, our house. And these are the type of friends that every time they come over, you just end up, the whole conversation revolves around the things of the Lord. By the way, you need those friends in your life. You actually need those friends in your life that will come over on a Friday night, eat pizza with you, and then will anoint you with oil as they leave your home. Maybe you need to be that friend to somebody else, by the way. I mean, it would be cool. What if you just started carrying anointing oil and, uh, I don't know, pray about that one. But they come over and every single time before we leave, whether we're at their house or our house, we get together three or four times during the year. We anoint each other with oil. We pray over our children. We bless each other. Sometimes we give words to each other based on what God is saying to us. And we just believe the best for each other. And we were talking about the season that Mikael and I went through as my wife is holding baby Emma, our third child, the rainbow baby, the promised, the promised child. And, and my friend, he's looking at her and he's like, she's proof that God still answers prayers, even after a season where it felt like he didn't. That she's proof that you can go through unanswered prayer after unanswered, or seemingly unanswered prayer after unanswered prayer, but he can still answer a prayer even at the end of that. Does this make sense today? And here's what God said so clearly in that moment. We're just on our living room. We're just talking. I got to wrap things up. I'm almost done. And he said, I brought you through the Babylonian season to develop your trust. And then and I, I brought you out of Judah because I, I needed to develop your trust in Babylon that I couldn't develop in Judah. And then in this third, in this third child, baby Emma, her name means whole, her name means complete. He said, I brought you through that season with Emma for you to understand a greater measure of faith. Between the miscarriages and between when we got pregnant for Emma, I sat across lunch with a, uh, a, a guy from the East Campus, good friend of mine. He's a spiritual mentor to me. He's, I'm not even gonna name his name because he wouldn't want that. He's just very humble. And we sat across the table from each other between the miscarriages and between the pregnancy. So we didn't know, we were just in, we were just in the wilderness in that time. And he said to me, and he like, he's really buff. He also like flexed on me in the spirit, pretty much. But he looked at me and he said, super intense like I can picture his eyes he's super intense he's like Michael you're gonna have a third baby and your faith is going to bring about that third child and I'm like weeping I'm like weeping over the fajitas I'm just drenching them all I'm crying and he's like the Lord has a third child for you and your faith and so here's what I did because we had lost a lot of faith we thought well maybe this is God's plan you know, sometimes you get there and you're like, well, maybe, maybe God didn't speak. Maybe I misheard. He looked at me and he said that. So I called, I called my wife on the way home, just tears in my voice. And I said, babe, I know we just went through death after death after death, but I believe that we are going to have a third kid. And I believe that we need to stand on 100% faith that it's going to happen. I know what we went through, but we're stepping out of Babylon because we learned to trust the Lord. Now, this is a season where we need to have faith in the Lord. Here's what you do, and here's how I'm going to close. As you pray and as you fast for the next 19 days, you have 100%, 100% faith that God is going to answer your prayer. Not 99%, not 98%. You stand firm with 100% faith. And then guess what? If the Lord answers the prayer differently, that's how I want to say it, then you transfer and you say, okay, 100% trust in that moment. A hundred. You can have both, by the way. You can have 100% faith and 100% trust. Here's what I sense the Lord is doing in this house. At all of our locations, I just want you to close your eyes. At all of our locations, if you need a miracle, 
I just want you to raise your hand right now. Don't wait. If you need a miracle in your life, if you need a miracle in your family, you're up to get a health diagnosis, I want the prayer team to begin praying at all of our locations, just in your seat. Many hands lifted all across all of our locations. You need a miracle. Just lift one or two hands to heaven. And I want, I want the prayer team to be praying. I want the staff to be praying. And I'm going to pray right now as we close this sermon. In Jesus' name, I pray for 100% faith over each hand that's lifted in the auditorium today. I pray for supernatural healing to come forth over the next 19 days. I pray for supernatural deliverance to come forth over the next 19 days. I pray that you would give them clarity. I pray in Jesus' name that you would speak to them. I pray that you would align their steps. I pray that if there's sickness in their body, it would be gone right now in Jesus' name. I pray that if there's pain in their mind, that you would release it right now in Jesus' name. I pray for any strongholds, any addictions that are currently taking place, that you would break them right now in Jesus' name. We pray for miracles, signs, and wonders that would come through by pure faith. We love you. We trust you. We believe in you. If anyone at the sound of my voice across all of our campuses does not know King Jesus, does not know Jesus, and you'd like to, you'd like to start fresh with Jesus today. On the count of three, I just want you to raise your hand. You'd like to make a new commitment to Jesus and begin your relationship with him. If that's you on the count of three, lift your hand. One, two, three. You need to commit your life to Jesus today. and You're gonna make that commitment to him. If that's you, just raise your hand. We're gonna put a white card in your hand when you raise your hand. Anyone else? Would you repeat after me at all of our locations, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I repent of my sins. I choose to follow you in the middle of Babylon. I love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can we celebrate the word of the Lord today?